Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm here this Friday with artist Jonathan Keats and our own Marek Reynas. I'm going to turn it over to Marek to introduce Jonathan officially, but he's coming into us from San Francisco, California. Marek, take it away. Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Marek Reynas. I'm an associate professor of sculpture, but I also uh, am a Curator at large at Pankerch Museum in Alaska, which is uh, related to our conversation. I'm extremely excited about finally having the opportunity to uh, have a Jonathan um, with us today. We're planning on this visit for some time, and maybe it's actually happened because, because of the COVID. Um, I'm planning to actually uh, introduce uh, Jonathan reading his, his bio, but also I want to share with you my, um, my first impression when, I, when we met uh, a couple of years ago, or more than that, actually, in, in Alaska. I, as an artist, I always felt a certain amount of freedom and um, creative freedom, personal freedom, and I always felt like kind of I exercised this through my, through my life. Then I met Jonathan, and um, my first impression was that actually I felt like a drone who is hovering just above the Earth, limited by gravity, and I met somebody who actually is elevated way above the about my level and somewhere in the somewhere in the sky and once a while it's landing to produce something and then quickly go back to the sky to think about those ideas without any limitation without any um any, any barriers uh which sometimes we artists kind of feel limited by time resources space acclaimed as a poet of ideas by the new yorker and the multimedia philosopher prophet by the atlantic Jonathan Keats is an artist, writer, curator, and experimental philosopher based in the United States and Italy. He is conceptually driven, interdis interdisciplinary pro projects explore all aspects of society through science, technology, and culture. He has exhibited and lectured at dozens of institutions worldwide, including Arizona State University, Stanford University, the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, Swiss Next in San Francisco, King's College London, and many, many others. He's author of six books on subjects ranging from science and technology to art and design. Most recently, You Belong to the Universe, Buckminster Fuller and the Future, published by Oxford University Press. Jonathan is also the author of a weekly online art and design column for the Forbes. He has been artist in residence at the Frank Hofer Institute for Building Physics at the Los Angeles County Museum, a Black Mountain College Legacy Fellow at the University of North Carolina Asheville, and Research Fellow at Nevada Museum of Art and Art Center and Environment. He's currently Polar Lab Artist at the Anchorage Museum. He's also a visiting scholar at San Jose State University, and he's also an artist in residence at both SETI Institute and UC Berkeley. He graduated summa cum laude from Amherst College with a Bachelor of Art degree in philosophy and interdisciplinary studies. Jonathan, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Charlotte and thank you for being up so early. I'm delighted to be here. I, I think that maybe an 8 a.m. class is, well, I mean, it's 11 a.m. there. Maybe I wouldn't uh, be up this early if I were a student, but I'm trying to be responsible and I'm excited to be talking with you. Great. Thank you for, for being with us. And uh, let's start with the question, which is actually a uh, question sometimes um, artists find maybe too cliche, but in the same time, in your case, I think it's kind of interesting question and important how philosopher become an artist or maybe more important why philosopher decide to become an artist. Well, I, as you alluded to, I studied philosophy in school at Amherst College, and I found philosophy to be exhilarating, and also I found it to be deeply frustrating. It was exhilarating because I was grappling with big ideas and was delving into the long history of examining the world through vantages of of philosophers ranging from uh, from Socrates to um, sorry, I'm staring right at my face here. Is there a way in which to stop that? Um, 
It's oh, I have to make some noise too, so you can see my face. Okay, well, I'm I'm moving this way. Sorry about that. So, so yes, yeah, so studying uh, philosophers, and so on the one hand, it was really remarkable to be able to delve into these materials, but on the other hand, there weren't a lot of people I could talk to about these ideas, and not only that, the ways in which I was able to pursue them were. It was rigorous, which was great, but also quite rigid. So ultimately what I did was I, I abandoned philosophy because it just seemed to me like I was ultimately having a conversation with five other people. I couldn't really have a conversation with my mother about this. I couldn't have a conversation with many of my peers. And I had always seen philosophy as being well, for a long time, I'd seen it as being what I wanted to do with my life. And the reason why I wanted to be a philosopher was because I wanted to be able to have those conversations with everybody about everything. And so I found that ultimately I could do all that, but it needed to be on my own terms outside of that context, outside of the academic realm. And actually the one realm that I found that seemed to be amenable to this was, was art, the art world. Because the art world is undefined in a way that almost no other domain in society is right now. Whereas almost all domains have become increasingly defined and increasingly narrow as time has gone on. If you think about the sciences, you are no longer a scientist, but you're studying probably some very narrow subfield in quantum mechanics. If you are a philosopher, you probably are working within um, analytic philosophy and some realm of, of formal logic within analytic philosophy. Whereas art is increasingly as a result, I think, of the Duchampian turn and as a result of the fact that anything goes and nobody really knows what art is anymore, that therefore you no longer need to be, as was the case perhaps a century and a half ago, a painter or a sculptor defined in a very specific way by a certain set of rules, by a certain, certain uh, set of skills and working within a particular tradition using a, a specific craft. Um, you know, if anything can be art, then what has happened is that a lot of people have spent a lot of time replicating the Duchampian trick of putting other versions of the urinal into a gallery and effectively not really doing much other than affirming what happened back in around 1913. But on the other hand, you could really get away with a lot. And that's what I've been doing for the rest of, for, for my life ever since I escaped philosophy, I, I, I escaped academia, was taking advantage of this utter and complete freedom. And so what I did specifically was I took one, I took a, a, a number of the ideas that interested me in philosophy and also techniques from philosophy and brought them into a practice that was and remains very much in public within the realm of, of arts and culture and that could abuse deliberately some of the ways of knowing or ways of understanding or modes of exploration that philosophy has. And in particular, the thought experiment has interested me where the thought experiment is in philosophy, a way in which you make an argument, you basically posit a counterfactual and an alternate reality in other words, and you lead lead people along until there's a logical contradiction that you've already foreseen and planted. And as a result of that inconsistency, you trounce your opponent 
and you make your point. Well, I guess that I, I abandoned philosophy not only because I didn't want to be constrained to a specific subfield and to a small and narrow group of people who I was able to talk to about those ideas, but also because I didn't really have any answers and I didn't really believe that I should or that, that there are any answers or if there are, they seem like they are only interesting to the extent that they provoke new questions. So we, is, is it a good moment to actually segue to your first project, to the Cogito oh, sure. project? So, um, so yeah, so I, um, just very briefly, so what, what I did, and I'm trying right now to get us to that slideshow here. Um, hold on just a second. I should be smoother at this, I realize, but. Um, one second. This may work. Yeah, we're seeing it. Great. So, so yeah, so I, um, I saw the thought experiment as being a means by which to undertake philosophy in a very public way where I didn't have an answer or I was pursuing questions. And to do that, what I did was to genuinely think of the thought experiment as an experiment rather than as a mode of argumentation. So to pose a counterfactual by putting out in the world some alternate reality that we could enter into collectively and we could then explore it and we could use it as a basis then for looking upon our own world. So um, I don't know that that naturally segues so well into my first project. So I'm going to improvise here and say that the thought experiment is amongst many other things a a way in which to, to do things that are meant for one purpose in order to, 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 to misapply methodology in order to be able to explore it. And so this very first project was, I, I suppose, not only um, a self-conscious work of art about art, but also was a misapplication of technology, of, of, a, of a methodology in order to be able to explore ideas. So I don't know, do you want to, uh, do you want me to talk about this project or? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe briefly because we have a lot of projects to talk, to talk about. So, uh, um, so I, I, in, in one of many of your statements, you, you know, you, you, you express kind of desire to, and even today, when you, when you mentioned about how um, alienating was your experience with, with uh, philosophy environment, and in many cases, you, 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 you said about the ability to create the language, visual language, and the project which will be accessible for anybody and, and quickly kind of intellectually and emotionally comprehended. Uh, so this kind of inclusive quality of the work, I think it's already somehow present itself in, in this very first project. Um, if you can mention that a little bit in, the, in that context. Sure, so basically what I did was I sat and thought and my thoughts were the artwork. So I, I, I wanted to see, I wanted to figure out how to, how to, how to make art, how to, be an artist um, as a way in which to reapproach a way uh, as a way in which to reapproach being a philosopher. And so, what philosophers do all day long is they think, and artists, in some way, make things and then often sell them in a marketplace and I wanted to figure out what the absolute, in a sense, the minimum viable product would be in terms of what I could make as an artist using what I had learned how to do as a philosopher. And that was thinking, thought. 
So what I did was I thought for, for 24 hours and I had a factory time clock set up and I would punch in on the time clock and think a thought. And then when I had thought it, I would punch out. And the thoughts themselves were the artwork and they were available for sale as artwork where you would reveal your annual income to the gallerist and you would then pay for my thoughts by the minute, whatever it was that you were paid. And you would then own the thought as an artwork, but you wouldn't know what it was because I would never tell you. In fact, if I were to tell you what I had thought, it would be a representation of that thought, not the thought in its own right. And therefore you wouldn't really have anything more than you had to begin with. It was the ownership of the thought itself that I construed as being the artwork. And so in a way it's following in the tradition of Saul Witt and others in terms of what, where the art is and what the art is. But on the other hand, it was an attempt at trying to figure out what a thought is. And philosophy does a lot of work with thinking, but exactly what this thing is that we do as philosophers, or they do as philosophers, since I was no longer one in any sort of formal sense. Um, well, and what we do, all of us, all the time, seemed like it was something that maybe be interesting to, to look at from the outside, instead of just assuming thinking as, that thinking is just something that we do. Thinking about thinking seemed to me to be a way in which to um, consider the value of thinking and thought in our world, where our world seemed and seems today increasingly to tend toward doing as being what is valued or making as what is valued. And to me, thinking seems like it certainly deserves some consideration. So taking the factory time clock and this context of work and the thought as, a, as work and as a work was a way in which to, to generate a conversation around what is thinking and what, what role does it play in our society? What value does it have in our society? Do you think that um, <clears throat> as we're moving to the next project, and, I, and I'm very much excited about talking about next project also because we have a lot of uh, visual artists, photographers in, in, in the audience, uh, uh, there is obviously connection between again, uh, the ability to uh, measure time of, I mean, time is spent thinking and trying to put the value to it. I see that some kind of relation to the deep time photography and um, the cameras you are setting to be able to record record 100 years or possibly longer. And I think this is important project right now because I think the last six months as we are observing time kind of fluctuating, changing its speed for some people it's going fast, for some people going slow. Uh, our perception of time as we are very often uh, limited in our movement and contact with other people, I think dramatically change. I think this project talking about recording long period of time, which telling us about some reality is kind of fascinating. Would you, would you talk about first about just general technical principles, what the deep time photography was? So yes, and I think that time is a, a theme in my work, not deliberately because I don't really, I never really set out to have themes. In fact, I thought that I was doing something different every time. And when I set out to do something, it, it interests me because it seems meaningful right now, but also feels entirely new in terms of the nature of the exploration. Like, I just don't know what's gonna happen or I don't know what this means. I certainly didn't know what sitting and thinking, what that would mean until I did it. And when I set out to, um, to explore photography in this way, I didn't know what it meant, nor did I connect it in any way to a factory time clock and to this other way of keeping time. But of course these things connect and meanings can sometimes accrue as a result of those connections that may just as each individual work, if it is interesting, in my opinion, 
it generates possibilities that otherwise were not uh, present. Um, that other that were not thought of beforehand. For some reason, the computer is. I, I'm sorry. I I screen I I screen. I'm I'm actually screening your PowerPoint to just give you oh, a presentation of what you're talking about. Great. Sorry so about um, so yes, I mean just just to say that often things connect in ways that that carry meanings that were not meant, and I think this connection of time is one that we can come back around to. So. And to me, this is important. This is, this is really a way in which the work can remain interesting and can continually engage me is that not knowing can lead to uh, realms of knowing or of thinking that would not be accessible by any other means. So what I have been doing is taking pictures or at least starting that process. And so the, the, the project that you're showing some images from began in, in some sense, began in Berlin uh, about five years ago when I was invited to exhibit some work and was thinking about what might be interesting to do in a city that I had gotten to know and that I found by virtue of the fact that I continually found the city transformed each time that I returned to it, um, that I wanted to figure out how these transformations that were visible to me by my return to the city in a way that was punctuated, going back there every year. And that seemed really relevant to the future of Berlin because so much of what was, in my opinion, really exciting about Berlin was being obliterated through the process of gentrification. How it might be possible for those who live there to have some perspective on that process in order then to be able to ask the question of what sort of city they want. and. I think that living in any city, living any in any place, you don't really notice the changes that are taking place on an everyday basis. So I think that it's important to be able to get outside of yourself in order to be able to um, consider the implications or the impact of the changes that you're making. So I thought of surveillance photography and surveillance cameras are of course set up all over the place and already were when I started this project. Um, and so my thought was, what if instead of surveillance being something undertaken by the government or by your neighbor, what if it were taken, undertaken by those who are most impacted by the decisions that are made in a city yet have the least influence over those decisions? That is the, the next generation. So what I set out to do was to make cameras that would have such a long exposure time that they would, the image would not be for us, but rather would be for those in the far future, a hundred years out. And so these cameras are meant to be, they're very simple and meant to be ubiquitous. And the way in which they work is that they are, um, they're pinhole cameras, so they let in very little light. And they, instead of using film, they use ordinary black paper, which will fade very gradually in sunlight. So basically what you're doing through the pinhole is that you're focusing, you're projecting whatever the camera is looking at onto the surface of the paper. And you're doing so in a way that is quite dim, but that is sufficient to fade the paper very, very slowly. So what you end up with is a picture that is really um, kind of the composite of all that has transpired over that full hundred year period. Uh, you might imagine that the camera is looking out on a cityscape with, with uh, small houses 
and after 30 years, some skyscrapers are built. So what you would see in that case would be approximately, you'd see a double, sort of a double negative effect. You'd see both and you would therefore be able to see how change, you'd be able to see the change and you'd be able to consider the change in a way that might be of interest to you as a future generation. But to me, what was most important was the fact that we could imagine that change. And moreover, we could evaluate the decision to make that change from the standpoint of what the camera might show. And we could change the picture. We could make decisions on the basis of what we wanted the next generation to see. So it suddenly means that we have this 100 year perspective in terms of the decisions that we make, that we're thinking from the standpoint of 100 years in the future while simultaneously acting in the moment when we have the chance to be able to influence what's happening over the next 100 years. And therefore, we're no longer just in the moment in terms of our thinking and in terms of our actions. So can I can I interrupt can I, because I'm sorry I'm trying to con control the time yeah. and we have so much, so many topics I yes. just want to make a little a little comment in relation to this particular project which is I find very inspiring not only because your own intention and 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 um, and, and and the goals you you put uh, in front of it but I think that the project is touching on two interesting relations in between history of photography which was uh, you know, we, we, we can imagine that those old boxy apparatus, was, which was, you know, was taking time to set them up and uh, the time exposure was much longer. And the objects they were creating, um, I mean, obviously they were printed and they were printed on sometimes very heavy paper and they became very important documents. And I'm thinking about this in, in, the, in the context of contemporary photography, which is, uh, you know, extreme fast snapshot, which very often exist in the very short period of time on the screen and quickly forget about them. The everybody now is a photographer and everybody is kind of oversaturated with the images that they produce. And I think about also the idea, you, you mentioned one of the interviews of the idea of this camera being a 1,000 year, year old camera. And, and I think that this camera, probably the image which will record it will be a, a, a just a noise of some kind. I mean, a uh, collection of dust and speckles and, 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 and strange um, grainy images, which I see this as a camera for, of the universe photographing us because in the kind of larger cosmic and universe point of view, this, that's the way we are. We are, I mean, a small, tiny, irrelevant civilization, which is pretty much create a little noisy image for a split second and in the larger scheme of things, um, of the universe itself, or even in the life of the earth itself, we are nothing. We are just this kind of grainy, fady, abstract image of no, no meaning. I think that's really interesting. And certainly the, the noise, what seems to us to be the noise from the perspective that we're capable of might be the signal, indeed is the signal, from an enlarged perspective. If you enlarge the perspective uh, sufficiently, uh, then ultimately the noise has significance because the noise was generated through processes that are real in their own right. And therefore that you are at some meta level, I guess, you are ultimately showing something. And I think that this process of reflection on signal and noise as a reflection on where we are relative to what we're considering is really important within the context of deep time and within the context of our engagement in a city or on the planet. And so in the case, very briefly, of the Millennium Camera, what we're looking at is not a hundred years, but a thousand years, um, where the context is really to do with climate and climate change and the decisions that we make about um, what sort of planet 
in a thousand years, we, we, we have a profound effect on what happens a thousand years from now, but we're not very good at thinking about it. So making that shift from a thousand years seeming impossibly far out to a thousand years being something that is present in the moment because there's a camera that's taking a picture that will be seen potentially in a thousand years and that we can imagine what picture is being made and therefore we can calibrate our actions accordingly. That sort of telescoping in while telescoping out, I think is essential as a matter of action and of responsibility, but it also points to what you're getting to, which is the fact that um, what is invisible, what is imperceptible to us or what is unintelligible to us is something that we need to grapple with even if we cannot directly perceive it, there may be means by which to do so that are indirect by understanding what the mechanism is that is what seems to us to be noise in order to be able to recognize that it is signal, even if we're not biologically, physiologically capable of, of recognizing or of grappling yeah. with that signal. Jonathan, we, we met, we met in, in Alaska, which is a kind of interesting, it, interesting um, story by itself. Um, uh, we met there, and I have a great opportunity to actually observe you and, and be part of the uh, development of the project um, called Alaska River Time, which again d directly connects to the conversation to the idea of the deep time, our perception of time, uh, a certain level of, uh, I think, kind of our um, limitation by being under the constant terror of the atomic clock, which is supposed to be objective, but it's, we know it's not really objective. And also when we think about the environment, we think about the, the landscape itself in Alaska, it's difficult not to think about it there. It also in the context of the climate change, uh, river seems to be um, probably, we don't think about it that much. We, when we think about the climate, we think about icebergs, ice, we think about maybe now burning forests. We don't think about the river as a, probably one of the best way of actually measure our time in the context of our ability to survive on this earth. I mean, the moment the clock of the river will stop, most likely our civilization will stop as well. Would you talk about this project for a moment? So, yeah, so it was um, a project that now is going on for uh, three, four years, maybe more than that at the Anchorage Museum, where the, what, what led me to think about it, which is maybe a good way into it, was the, the recognition that time has in many ways been the means by which society has progressed, where progress is problematic in the sense that it has led to really remarkable inventions and uh, made life a lot easier in many ways for us. But on the other hand, has resulted in gross inequality and also planetary calamity. So time has allowed for us to progress in that way, understanding progress not as being necessarily a positive thing, but simply being the way in which one thing has led to another. Um, because it has allowed us to organize as a society without regard to the planet on which we live. And it has allowed power brokers, corporations, to control constituencies through cl a clock that is ultimately um, originally based on astronomical observation, then based on mechanical, and then ultimately based on the, uh, ultimately the atomic clock. Um, it has allowed for a sort of organization of society that is incredibly efficient. And 
what I've been trying to figure out is how we can break that efficiency in order to enlist time for other purposes that are based on equally valid premises and that seem to me to be equally valid in terms of the consequences. So instead of looking at time as an abstraction that we use without regard to the impact of our actions on our planet based on the measurement of an atom, what I've done is to look at time as an emergent phenomenon of the planet itself. And there are many ways in which to do so. And I, if there's still time, I will talk about another one of these. We have a limited time, time now, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but rivers, by virtue of their flow, I mean, it's a natural kind of a metaphorical level at which you can start to think about this, that time flows and rivers do. And rivers in terms of their flow can be used as a calibration for time. And can you might be able to do so, for instance, by putting a water wheel into a river where the water wheel is moving at one revolution per minute based on the flow of the river. The idea here in the case of Alaska River Time is to set that up in a way that is enlisting US Geological Survey meters as opposed to building a water wheel, and then to stand back and to give the river authority to tell us what time it is. So that the river may flow more quickly or more slowly as a result of both the natural fluctuations throughout the day and through the seasons, but also as a result of climate and the changing climate due to the fact that in, as an obvious case, rivers that are glacially fed, glaciers will melt at different rates and in different ways as a result of different climate regimes. So the idea is basically to say, let's, let's give the river authority to tell us what time it is, and let's calibrate our lives on the basis of what time the river tells us. And this has a number of different impacts potentially, one of which is the time becomes contingent. That is to say that it's not really possible when you're using this clock to say when 2.30 p.m. tomorrow is going to come because 2.30 p.m. might come sooner or later based on the fact that ultimately, and we're back to signal and noise, that the river's flow has, is, is noisy from our perspective. It's, um, it's unpredictable to an extent that we need to be present in the moment and attentive to the environment in terms of making the observation to know what time it is. Um, and that seems really important from the standpoint of, of this of being present and of being attentive to the effect of our actions. And I guess that that's another aspect to it is the fact that it, time becomes a, a mode of observation, that the clock becomes an observatory. And Would you say that this clock is maybe a form of a possible slowing Anthropocene? Anthropocene? Um, I don't know that, well, the clock so the way in which we, we've designed this particular clock is using a number of different rivers and averaging their flow. And the clock will, on the basis of, so the clock is using both glacially fed rivers and spring fed rivers. And just to give some sort of sense of the complexity of what we're measuring and why it is, on the one hand, so difficult to make predictions about when it's going to be 2.30 tomorrow, but also how rich the clock is in terms of what it's showing us. Glaciers will melt more rapidly in Alaska if, climate, if the climate changes in the way that it has been. We'll, we'll melt more rapidly probably for the next 20 years or so, and then we'll start to slow down in terms of the rate of melt, and ultimately there won't be glaciers, and therefore the glacially fed rivers will not be there. So all of that is implicit in the clock. And I don't see this as a doomsday clock in the sense that there is necessarily one thing that will happen versus another um, and that it is meant to demonstrate something, but rather I see it as an open-ended inquiry. And this is in general, I think what I'm after in terms of my work and going back to what I was saying about philosophy earlier is that I'm not trying to make a point. It's not a polemical statement. It's an investigation and it's an open-ended investigation where Time could move more quickly or more slowly in the future. The Anthropocene is not 
inevitable as an epoch, as a geological epoch. It is certainly an episode. It certainly is something that's going to be visible for a very long time to come um, for geologists, but we don't need to enter into it and stay there. We can look at it as an episode within a greater Holocene, and we can return to an upper Holocene by remediation, by our actions. So ultimately the clock challenges us to figure out what sort of world we want because we have an effect on time. We're in a relationship with time. It's become, the clock is a feedback mechanism in addition to being a mode by which we are alerted to contingency and to, and we are brought into relationship with the environment in a more direct and immediate way. This uh, idea of, um, you know, changing this clock or kind of relation between geological time, the, the big geological time <laughs> and, and our human time or human civilization time, I think it's extremely obvious in the, in the context of this other clock project, uh, a, a bristle cone. And I have, a, I mean, probably many people have a chance to actually stand next to those trees I come from a uh, from relatively old city of 1,000 years. Um, you live probably in the village in Italy, which is a few thousand years old. Um, so we are kind of, let's say, we are used to the old things, but there is something extremely eerie about standing to the next, and standing next to the living organism, which can remember Roman Empire. Almost I feel like it's like swimming with the Greenlandic shark, uh, who can remember you know, <laughs> uh, medieval times. Um, although they look almost dead, but they are not. Uh, and they are almost living clocks. They are actual living clocks on some level. Would you talk about this project a little bit? A few minutes. Sorry, sure. I just feel like it's important to mention this project in the context of the river clock. So uh, what I've been looking at more broadly than rivers is a planet as a whole and all the systems on the planet that are keeping time and that could potentially be used as a basis by which we tell time and we calibrate society because all of them are relevant. And of course, everything, everything does indicate. And trees are particularly interesting for the fact that when we think of a calendar, we often think of, when we, when we think of a tree, we often think of it in terms of a calendar from the standpoint of the fact that it grows a, a ring every year. And, but what's interesting to me is not the fact that it grows a ring every year, which is interesting in its own right, but what's even more interesting is the fact that the thickness of the ring varies on the basis of environmental factors, the whole complex of environmental fa factors ranging from rainfall to carbon dioxide level. And that if you were to imagine taking a tree and putting a spiral of markers around it, you could on those markers, taking the average annual growth today, mark what you expect the tree's girth to be and what you expect the tree's girth to be becomes the basis for uh, what, what time each mark on the spiral indicates. And then you can allow the tree, well, not allow, the tree is going to grow on its own. So you might have for, in the case of a bristlecone pine tree, you're talking about 5,000 year sp time span. So it might be that you have in 500 year increments going out 5,000 years, uh, what you estimate based on current growth to be um, the, to, to, to be the, the girth of the tree in 500 years, 1,000 years and so forth writing the year on the marker and then standing back again and saying, okay, well, let's give the tree authority to tell us what time it is. The tree is going to grow more rapidly or more slowly than the average that we've taken on the basis of the climate and how the climate changes. And so in a sense, the tree then becomes a sort of uh, observatory and a calibration by which we're in a feedback, a relationship of feedback with the planet where time speeds up or slows down. Um, in the way that we conventionally define it and that we speed up or slow down as a result of it and that we can kind of potentially end up in some sort of, we can use it as a basis for a sort of dynamic homeostasis that we currently lack in the world by, by means of, of going on to the time kept by the clock. And so there's both 
the outdoor um, environmental artwork, which is up on Mount Washington. We're still working on building it. We haven't yet um, even raised the funds to do so, but we will. Um, so out on Mount Washington, where these bristlecone pine trees grow for 5,000 years to create this large scale work that then also is the basis for a clock that is at the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno that is um, taking much more um, fine measurement using a dendrometer, a device that's measuring the girth of the tree down to the micron. And that measurement then using the same principle is running a clock that becomes a sort of municipal clock. And that becomes a means by which people in the city are connected to, um, to, to the world at large and that their actions on an everyday basis are connected to these activities that are taking place in deep time. Right, I think we need to probably switch to uh, Eric and uh, invite some questions. We are slowly getting to the end of the session and there's probably a lot of questions. I, uh, I want to thank you. thank you again and I want to kind of also stress that probably could spend a few more hours talking about each of those projects and there are a few more projects actually in the PowerPoint I was hoping to talk about. We are slowly getting to the end of it. Um, yes, Eric, do you have any questions? Yeah, well, there were, I, that was great, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, I, I took a lot of notes and I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea of, uh, you know, speeding up and slowing down with the, the rate of, you know, a portion of the earth, the tree, a river, that, uh, that's a great thought experiment in and of itself. There were some student questions that uh, related to some of your other projects as well. Um, uh, let's see, there were some questions about um, the, and I don't know if you want to talk about any of these specifically, but um, for instance, the um, uh, porn for plants, uh, some of your work with botanicals, uh, other work with botanicals and things like that. There were some questions about um, the, uh, you the audience reception of that or, or how that was conceived in, in terms of, of your artwork? Certainly. So, um, and this is actually a good way to come back around to what I was starting to say earlier about the thought experiment and about posing a counterfactual, creating an alternate reality that we enter into as a way in which to, um, to do philosophy. So, I decided some years back that I should get into filmmaking. Um, it seemed like film was, movies were really popular, but I also realized that there were a lot of people already making them, um, you know, like James Cameron and, well, I mean, Thomas Edison even had been doing so. And so I didn't really have much of a chance of entering into that business, knowing really nothing about how to use the equipment, let alone uh, how to, how to make a feature. Um, I didn't have much chance of competing with, with any of the people who were already in the industry and therefore that I should think about other audiences, not just the conventional humans. And I realized, well, there are a lot of plants, more of them than there are of us, many more as it turns out. And not only that, but they're also the ideal audience to be able to watch or ex to experience a movie because what we're talking about is the play of light and plants perform photosynthesis. So they're able to experience the play of light in a way that's much more direct than we are able to do. So thinking about that, I thought about, well, what sort of movie might a plant be interested in? Because I'm not a plant. So uh, I needed to kind of think about this from on the outside. And I thought, well, you know, a lot of filmmakers when they're getting started, they get started in porn and, you know, pornography seems relatively universal in some way and plants, I guess that they probably would enjoy what would be not what we would consider to be porn, but what they would consider to be, which is honeybees pollinating flowers. So I filmed honeybees pollinating flowers and then turned that into a black and white um, shadow play, basically taking what, how they would experience that activity and um, made a, a movie out of it that was projected onto house plants. And then I subsequently went from that to trying to go a bit 
trying to go legit by making travel documentaries for plants. So I figured plants probably are not interested in the Roman Colosseum or the Eiffel Tower. They're interested in skies and other places that they don't get to go because they're rooted in the ground in one place or another. So I filmed skies in Europe to project onto plants in, in New York initially. And so, and then ultimately I, I did another project that involved making science fiction. But what I wanted briefly to get at with all of this is that we live in a world where so much of our experience is mediated, is by way of movies or by way of the screen more broadly. And it's really important, I think, for us to consider that as experience in relation to experience as it might have been understood by our grandparents or great grandparents, and to try to situate that sort of experience in a way that is more considered. Not to say that it is impoverished, but to say that there are differences and that we should be aware of them in terms of um, what we talk, what we think about when we think about having been someplace or done something. And so by introducing that to the botanical world, to plants, it allows us potentially to look at something that we do every day in a way that that makes it other, that, that makes it um, that makes it strange. Um, we are able to watch plants watching movies, and through that, to then be able to see ourselves and this activity that we don't really give any thought to on an everyday basis, to see it from the outside and to consider what the what the meaning of it is, and what the meaning of it is is really an open question. I think that what I try to do when I set up a thought experiment like that, when I create a work like that, is not to tell you what it means, because I don't know. And if I knew what it meant before I undertook it, then I wouldn't undertake it. I would just uh, talk to you about what I'm thinking, and you would say what you're thinking, and we could move on. Uh, but in this case, it's an open-ended invitation, I guess, in a sense, to enter into a conversation about something that we take for granted by virtue of the fact that it is um, taken and placed in another context where we're able to observe it at a meta level. And that can lead to other conversations as well that are equally interesting, including conversations about uh, perception and intelligence and what the nature of human intelligence is can be explored by considering what the experience is and how that experience is being processed by other organisms. So we can understand ourselves and our cognitive processes perhaps better as a result of getting outside of ourselves. And we can understand those in relation to other beings, which can lead to a, a greater understanding of ourselves but also can lead to a, an enriched sort of relationship with those other beings. And all of this is open-ended. And this to me is, this is a way in which I think philosophy can be interesting and even can be useful in society by bringing as many people as possible into this sort of conversation and allowing the conversation to be what people want to be talking about. But by having that conversation outside of the everyday where we take for granted any set of premises, that seems to me to be genuinely important, especially in a society that is democratic, where we, are, where we need to be able to build community and make decisions collectively that are collectively beneficial. We need to be having conversations that go beyond um, the immediate future and that go beyond also the assumptions that we have been given through our education or simply the assumptions that are latent and even really ultimately invisible in society itself. Thank you. Um, there, there's been a lot of research uh, apparently from the audience. So there's many people who wanted to wish you a happy early birthday, speaking of, of time. Um, 
Is your it was actually my, it was my river time birthday uh, about two weeks ago because the rivers in Alaska are flowing so much more quickly right now than the average. So. Oh, nice, nice. So happy belated river birthday then. Thank you. Um, the, uh, one of our colleagues, Heather Freeman, had a, a question about um, ethics in, in art that I thought was uh, really good. Um, how do you how do you see do do you feel art needs ethics? Um, and if so, how should this uh, become manifest or, or concrete in the in the practice of of art? I, I missed a few words there. Do I think what? Um, sorry. Do you feel art needs ethics? Mm. Uh, and if so, you know how would we manifest something like that or make it concrete? I don't think that art needs ethics necessarily, nor do I think that ethics needs art necessarily, but I think that ethics are important and that art is potentially a way in which to approach ethics that can be complementary to approaches that we typically think of when we think about ethics. So typically what we think about really ultimately is potentially politics, but ultimately is philosophy, um, is working at a level of abstraction and of argumentation and of, uh, of, of dispute. I think that what art can do within the realm of ethics is that it can offer, uh, it can offer opportunities to explore questions about what is right or just in ways that don't take the pre-existing polarity as a premise or as inevitable, and therefore that don't reinforce the differences and disagreements that seem to be effectively paralyzing us in terms of any sort of society that anyone really much wants to live in. So, so art can, in this enlarged definition, which is to say where anything, anything that you create can be considered to be art and where you can create alternate realities that the alternate realities can be counterfactuals but they can also be um, speculative visions of other other worlds that we can then consider our own world from those from the perspective of a utopia or of a dystopia or of some sort of alternate reality some sort of possible future that maybe is unclear in terms of whether it is good or bad but by interacting with that possible world and within it i think that it becomes a way first of all to be disoriented from in, in terms of our presumptions, in terms of the ethics that we think we understand and that we espouse often without really considering whether the premises are appropriate or right, that we can enter into conversation, into dialogue with others, having suspended all of that because it's a manifestly um, other place with a manifestly other set of rules. And we can play out those rules and consider what the implications are. And then we can, returning to the world in which we live, we can move toward what we consider to be collectively more favorable or away from what we consider to be catastrophic. So in the way that art, that the arts have always trafficked in, in fictions, I think that those fictions are incredibly powerful mechanisms for being able to um, 
to, to consider what is not necessarily the case, but what might be the case, and potentially to do so in ways that don't really allow for the assumptions when we make a move to whatever is immediately obvious to us in terms of our what we are going to do at, at the voting booth, for instance, that by entering into this space that is completely other, that we can reset, reconsider, and come to some sort of a deeper um, ethical relationship with the world and with each other. Because it's also about relationships, ultimately. It's about what we can, what we reach in the way of understanding by consensus. Otherwise, you can have all the ethics and all the ethical ideas that you want, but it doesn't mean that they're actually going to be implemented. So it's also, I think, a communal act that art invites, that we, can, we experience art communally, and that, or we can experience art communally, and that the communal experience can be a basis for figuring out what we want, for building some sort of consensus, and also for building the community that can bring about that uh, decision in the, re in the world in which we live, in the real world. Nice, thank you very much. Uh, Mark, I, I know you need to go. Jonathan, are, are you cool answering a few more questions or? Sure. Yeah, I can, oh, yeah. I'm happy to do so. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much. I need to leave, uh, I have another <laughs> Zoom meeting yes. back to back, but I really appreciate and I will catch up with you after the, after the session. Um, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed our Thank conversation, you. even if it was a bit one-sided. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Jonathan, there's there's a couple of questions about um, the uh, about developing as for for our students from their perspective about developing concepts um, and the idea of I think you know making artwork. Um, as a as a kind of object versus developing ideas and concepts and wondering if you had any advice for for you know how to merge those two how to you know uh you know you talked about the thought experiment as a premise for for getting you started do you have any other advice for students in terms of bringing that practice or bringing such a practice into their making I love making things. I, I always have, and it's always been as important to me as thinking things. And the reason for that is, well, one reason is that I like working with my hands. I enjoy it. And much as, much as what I do is motivated by the enjoyment that I get from thinking and from pursuing my own curiosity about the world, it also is motivated by the enjoyment that I get from making things. And to me, that isn't a justification, but nevertheless is, is, is I think, important to consider in terms of if you're going to make a lifetime of this, you probably want it to be something that that is enjoyable to you and that is interesting to you. So the reason why making things is important to me outside of that is that the tangibility of the, of the things that I make grounds thoughts, ideas, questions in, in the world such that we can experience them collectively. And that collective experience is what leads to the um, discovery of, to, to the exploration, to, the, to, to, to finding the meaning and even to reaching, reaching new, Re, 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 coming to new ways in which to act in the world. Um, it, it, by taking the counterfactual, by taking the alternate reality and instantiating it, it allows for us to be able to interact within it. And that enriches that alternate reality and enriches our interactions in a way that allows for a more... Um, nuanced and also for a more 
direct even, I would say, a direct, more direct way in which to then bring the results of that thought experiment back into the world in which we live. Another aspect of it that's really important to me is that there's a certain sort of a commitment involved in making something and putting something someplace where that thing is real in its own right. So the Millennium camera, I guess, is a good example of this. Uh, making a camera that most likely is not going to work out in terms of, of having an image that is at all intelligible, that's uh, at all visible in a thousand years. I mean, we're in beta. Nobody's ever done this before that I'm aware of. And certainly I'm, I'm working on the basis of what we know about photochemical processes and material science and so forth. But it, there are a lot of assumptions there about the, how I've gone about building the camera. And there are a lot of assumptions also about the uh, societal mechanisms that may allow for that camera to be there for as long as it needs to be in order to fulfill what to fulfill its promise. So for instance, Arizona State University, which you saw in the slideshow, you saw that one of the cameras was placed at, at Arizona State University looking at the town of the, the city of Tempe. So ASU has agreed to a thousand year loan of a camera and has pre-accessioned assigned, pre -assigned an accession number for the year 3015, I think, um, for accessioning the photograph, which I have preemptively donated to them. So all of these commitments are a way in which to ensure that this process comes to pass in terms of a product. Yet at the same time, there are so many unknowns that ultimately the unknowns come to the forefront as a result of this effort to operate within the knowns. And those unknowns I think are interesting in their own right. So there is, the fact that the camera is out there and that it is taking a picture that might be visible in a thousand years makes what is simply a kind of a, a conversation we might have into a, into a real world proposition where we really do need to consider our actions because there really might be someone in a thousand years who might see what we have done and might hold us responsible for it. Therefore, we can see ourselves more, um, more literally from the standpoint of the far future, and we can calibrate what we do uh, with a greater degree potentially of, um, it, 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 has, it has greater implications because of the fact that it really is out in the world. But it also means that all those unknowns can add layers of meaning to it. If the camera is stolen after a couple of years, well, that tells us something in its own right. That's a picture of society in its own right. So basically, putting, some, putting a, an object out in the world is a way in which to open up the meaning of the project and to allow the ideas to become other than what they initially were through the fact that that thing is in the world and the world will make of it and do with it what it will outside of my control. So it's a letting go, the making of something. And it's also a, a way in which to, uh, to grapple, on the other hand, with the ideas that led to that making and led to that thing in a way that is more immediate and is um, ultimately less avoidable, I guess. That, that, that it's there whether, I like, whether we like it or not, so we, we better try to, try to contend with it. So for students, I, I think that I don't have any advice um, I, and I've never really taken any advice. So my best advice is not to take any, but I think that, I think it's possible at least for me to start with an idea and to instantiate it and to use the instantiation in the same way that philosophical instruments or philosophical toys have been used through history. 
but to use the instantiation of it as a way in which to, to explore it and to amplify the exploration and to have some, something that can serve as a, um, as a meeting point for me with others in terms of that conversation. Or it might as well start with an object that I feel some, I think that it's interesting as a technical proposition to make this thing and then, then to consider what, what it means, what, what meaning spills out of it. And that seems equally generative. So working in multiple modes from the very concrete and specific to the very abstract and general and allowing for them to get mixed up in my practice is the closest thing that I have to a practice. That's great. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, I think that there's a lot to, to take away uh, for, for the students there. And, um, you know, the, the layers of the way, you know, you describe the, the, the millennial, uh, millennial camera project, you know, the layers of information and um, concept that, that um, have to be considered in like Arizona State agreeing to it and um that you know taking on this thousand year contract and it it really shows how an idea you know kind of you know rolls along and and can pick up its own its own kind of momentum so i, I think that that'll definitely resonate with the students um i i want to thank you so much we'll we'll wrap it up here thank you so much for agreeing to meet with us and this has been a real treat um and uh yeah I uh, hope to continue to see what you're doing and, and uh, hope to see you again in the real. Well, thank you. And I, I very much hope to get back to North Carolina. I was in Asheville for a semester. I would love to get out to Charlotte and to undertake a project with you and your students, something totally new. Who knows what it comes out to be? Who knows what it means? But I really appreciate the opportunity to talk and um Appreciate your questions. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Jonathan. And I'll hold you to that. We'll see you in Charlotte then.